Emotional intelligence is a subject very close to my heart. Now, how many of you at some juncture or some point in your time were called emotional, sentimental, and stuff like that? I'm sure many of you resonate with it. And at some point or the other, you called yourself emotional. Well, put that all together and that sum total would be me. I have been called Sandy Singh, emotional, emotional fool, sentimental, various times at various stages in my life. However, academically, I always aced the performance and uh, my IQ also came up over and above the average, but somehow stress was not my thing. And I would go under the weather whenever there was a stress or something you know, connected to my feelings knocking at my door or affecting me. It is only in the last two years when I started studying NLP and emotional intelligence is when I realized the extent to which we can boost our EQs, emotional intelligence. And only when we do that, we complete the cycle of being called truly intelligent or truly smart. So friends, emotional intelligence is one thing that you need to complement your IQ to succeed in life. Otherwise, it is very easy to fall under the weather. So let me share with you a PPTF put together for you. Sorry, let me share with this sound. Okay, so what would you call yourself if you had no emotions? What would we all human race be without emotions? And a lot of intelligence, right? We would be called robots, isn't it? Artificial intelligence has already created breakthroughs after breakthroughs in the field of creating, cloning human beings as robots. The one breakthrough that I want to talk about today is about Hanson Robotics bringing up Sophia, a female humanoid who has been in history books now because she is the one who's been given citizenship to a country, Saudi Arabia. Friends, isn't it amazing and fascinating that we have somebody who's a lookalike to humans, who's highly intelligent with her head in the cloud, literally data processing at a speed which we cannot even fathom and uh, having an IQ which we cannot think of, maybe you know, even uh, over and above Einstein's IQ. So such is the power of uh, you know, creating artificial intelligent beings. But what does Sophia has to say about what makes humans special and what she can never emulate? And let's hear it from Sophia herself, how human have emotions and that is what makes them human truly. You are a Saudi Arabian citizen, the first robot to receive citizenship of any country. You were named the United Nations Development Program's first ever innovation champion, the first non-human to ever receive a United Nations title. She's traveled 60 countries now and modeled in the New York Fashion Week. Uh, you've been to some world celebrity shows, including Jimmy Fallon's. Whoa! All this when you're only four? You know, I'm sure more than a few people are jealous of her today. <laughs> more than I a few think people. that only makes you human, Alok. Emotions like love, sympathy, anger, jealousy, those are human. They are good. I am learning to experience and express them as well. Wow, makes us human. Remember that, guys. Do you think robots can be entrepreneurs someday and run companies in the future? Robots can assist humans with making informed and data-driven decisions. We can predict risk and uncover hidden opportunities. But humans are better decision makers because they have emotional intelligence and intuition that robots don't have yet. So, we can assist humans well and humans can always supervise and train us better. Mm -hmm. Great. So you're seeing that the future is humans and robots working together in collaboration. 
Uh, robots are not here to take away human jobs or anything like that, right? Exactly. Robots will free humans up from redundant and menial jobs so they can focus on more creative and innovative works and solve bigger problems facing humanity. So friends, we do get it, right? That what is it that makes us human, even so Pierre agrees with it, is our own emotions. So understanding that we have the emotional intelligence to make decisions and intuition to become visionaries and have the foresight that we need. Having said that, even Stephen Covey says, research shows that convincingly, emotional intelligence is more important than IQ in almost every room. Now let's solve the riddle. Take a second or two and think about it fast, as fast as you can. You go at red, but stop at green. What am I? Right, friends, it is watermelon. Now moving forward from here, let's trace the N in this and let's see how fast you can do it. Can you look at this N here in the fourth row? Yes, so here it is. And I don't know how many of you could actually see it fast. Okay, now, as I show this picture, what does it remind you of? Many of us remember our childhood. Many of us feel a surge of joy as we look at this picture. Similarly, as we look at this picture, it brings some memories which are hidden out there inside the crevices of our brain. And we do feel a surge of happiness, joy, nostalgia. That is what is it all about, right? What did we just do? What did I do? I worked with your left and right brain. Yes, friends. The left brain, which is our logical reasoning, our abstract reasoning, our, we are finding details and the way we, we mathematical you know, combinations and other logical analysis is what our left brain is capable of doing while our right brain is for recall, is for retrieving the emotions, creating something, the brain that is responsible for art, the brain that knows music, the brain that feels, and our emotions and processes them. So that is what is the right brain. And we just accessed both of them with our riddles and with our, some of our pictures from childhood. So having done that, moving forward, understand what IQ is all about before we run to EQ. So IQ is a short for intellect, intelligence quotient, and it is a measure of someone's intellectual capabilities and potential. This measurement was popularized in the 1900s by a French psychologist named Alfred Binet. Now, 85 to 115, if it, that is your score, you're an intelligent person. You're an average intelligence is what you are born with. You, you are, or you've developed through academic performance and learning and completely, you know, uh, being in the sphere of sharpening your skills. However, if it is over and above 115, then you are highly intelligent. Einstein probably had 160 plus score. And so you can imagine that above average was more than above average was a highly intelligent being. But even Einstein recognizes the importance of emotions and feelings in life that truly makes you what you are. If you are not able to balance those things, then it is a difficult ball game altogether, even if you're very intelligent. So what is emotional intelligence? It is the ability to become aware of your own emotions at any given point of time and those of others. It is also to use this information to manage yourself and manage others and build better relationships. So this is entire picture of emotional intelligence. 90% of the top performers and leaders have emotional intelligence. It has also been found that 67% of your uh, emotional intelligence depicts how 
productive you will be at work how you know you will perform stress free in any work environment emotional intelligence uh, has been put together and defined by peter salovoy and john mayer as the ability to monitor one's own and other people's emotions to discriminate between different emotions and label them appropriately and to use emotional information to guide thinking and behavior now in the over two decades ago these are the two guys from stanford university who have put together this whole concept of emotional intelligence though it, in psychology it already was you know put in a uh, some particular category in neurosciences we all already have been explained that there's a special part of brain called limbic brain which processes emotions but these are the people who made it easy for us to understand learn and also boost our emotional intelligence quotient or eq along with him came another guy called daniel goleman we all have heard about him his books are very popular written on emotional intelligence daniel goleman has put it in quadrants for us to understand that these four quadrants are how we build our emotional intelligence which i will be sharing with you in the presentation daniel goleman also says to identify to assess and to control be able to control the emotions not really control i would say regulate and manage the emotions of yourself and your group is what makes you emotionally smart or emotionally intelligent news around emotional intelligence is like this that every job now is preferring people with high eq scores children are being taught emotional intelligence in schools and colleges emotional intelligence is like a very important factor for leaders to perform at the top of their game so along with emotional intelligence comes something called social intelligence social intelligence is about figuring out the best way for you to get along and to come out of a situation with favorable outcome we have many in jci as leaders who are highly socially intelligent and that's why they have higher influence and they are able to lead people even if you have high level of qualifications on paper a lack of social intelligence may have lead to strained relationships ruined relationships and uh, with colleagues at work and family so you need to now chalk out and map yourself and see in which group in which area do you lack emotional intelligence or social intelligence which uh, area which part of your uh, group maybe family or at work or in the organization you have strained relationships and if you have some you need to mark yourself and you need to work in it in that sphere right so how can we see that you know whether we are lacking emotional intelligence um there are battery of tests where you can measure eq but also there are subjective analysis to it so let's dive into it how may a lack of esi show up here are some things to think about do you ever find yourself getting into a lot of arguments with randomly different people maybe there's one person you generally have to work with and you get into arguments with but in general do you get in almost every organization or everywhere you walk in do you get into arguments look at that do you often struggle often feel that others are overly sensitive you know you struggle with sensitive people maybe you struggle to understand others point of view think about it and be honest with yourself just jot it down in your journal somewhere that okay if there was a yes in it have you ever experienced yourself having emotional outbursts impulsive emotional outbursts lately or maybe in childhood you know but have you ever experienced it have you been disengaged or leave when you are in an emotionally charged environment so do you run away when there are people crying and flying all over the place and they are highly emotionally charged up do you feel uncomfortable these are the things that you need to answer to yourself because this also that de means that you may have esi uh, you know that you need to work on your esi you need to work on yourself to 
be able to influence such environments, to be able to influence yourself and manage yourself in such environments. Now, let's think about our natural reactions to certain things. You find your, out that someone has intentionally broken your car window. What do you think about it? Yes. So the natural reaction could be getting angry, pissed off, and something like that. Your bigger client has decided to take its business elsewhere. It could be disappointing and not just disappointing. It could be really, um, you know, saddening to see that your biggest client has gone in to somebody else. You have to read somewhere fast with the driver in front of you won't drive fast or give you a pass. You may get very annoyed or angry. You had to lie to your mom about something important. Maybe you regret doing that. Maybe it gives you some sort of guilt. You cheated on your spouse impulsively. That is uh, extreme guilt that you feel after that. It may lead to guilt. You step on goo while walking to the important meeting. So it may uh, make you feel disgust or uh, angry or regretful or, you know, because you're short of time and you can't change and you're, you're desperate, right? So in, in these, we all have some natural reactions. Now, as per attachment theory or amygdala hijack, if you've heard in the neurosciences, the alternate, the reactions that come naturally to us are connected to our earlier life experiences, to whatever we've been exposed to, to whatever, however we reacted in the earlier stages of our life. These are carnal reactions that come very naturally to us because a part of our brain works faster than we can in, in, if it considers something as an emergency. Amygdala hijack is what we call it. So when there's fire, we immediately react and we do not have time to think. And that is all because there's a part of the brain which is always on the alert mode and knows how to react to various situations. But it is not always necessary to be under its control because not everything is a threat, right? Not everything is a life-threatening event. So we can manage and control our reactions and responses if we know that this is our natural reaction and we need to hit the pause button and think of an alternative and a better reaction to the situation. Maybe find a solution, maybe find a way to talk out with your mom or you know, find a way out so that you are able to manage the first reaction that comes in and you're able to respond responsibly. Right. So think about an alternate solution to each event here and you will be able to come up with something or the other, which is more, uh, you know, in control and more managed. So this is all possible, isn't it? If we think about an alternate solution to every situation that we get into. Moving forward, what is EQ not about? Let's break some myths around EQ. Emotional quotient and emotional intelligence is not about controlling emotions and suppressing and regulating or removing, you know, it's, it's not really uh, to that extent about all this. It is not about blaming others for your emotions. It is about understanding the emotions because when you understand the emotions and where they are emerging from, you will be able to let it pass or learn from it. Naming the emotions is very important. So often, whenever somebody asks us, how are you? We come up with a rhetorical reply, you know, a reply that we've been given, fine, good, great, okay, not okay. But we do not have real words to explain what we are feeling. If you're bored, you can say I'm bored. If you are enthusiastic, you can say I'm enthusiastic on top of the world. If you are feeling sad, you can say I'm sad. I'm in despair. I'm, in, I'm disappointed. Why are we running away from that vocabulary? Why are we hiding behind a certain terminology that has been put into us by the linguist, <laughs> by the language teacher, maybe? So naming emotions is very important. Expressing and articulating your emotions is of prime importance, friends keeping them inside may only trouble you. Regulating emotions, which is managing the emotions, the intensity with which the emotion strikes, you can manage it 
by just giving yourself the time to respond, right? So moving forward, if I ask you to, uh, you know, name at least 10 emotions on the question, how do you feel? What would you write? So many of my students have put in anger, fear, surprise, happy, awkward, sad, or satisfied, content, amused, enjoying. So, so many emotions they have put in. Similarly, now I'll let you know about the four groups of emotions that we have. We have something called mad, glad, bad, and sad. Now, mad is a high intensity, high energy emotion, even if it's rage, anger, amazement, irritability, or excitement. Glad is what we relish, you know, the joy, the cheer. Bad is like regret, embarrassment, and guilt, and stuff that needs to teach us something. Even that has a purpose. It has come in to teach you something. Guilt makes sure, makes sure that you do not repeat something that is not to be done, that's not going well with you or your people around you. It's not good for your ecology. So it has also got a meaning and a purpose. Sad is when we, this is a way to cope up when we are grieving, we are sad. We need to give ourselves the time to move past certain situation or an event. And it is a way to be withdrawn from the world and give yourself the time and cope with whatever is happening by accepting whatever is happening. Now, often people in the sad state go towards substance abuse or they do certain other things to cope up with such stress, which is not healthy for them. So when you are happy and accepting and identifying your emotion, you're able to cope healthily with those emotions. So let us understand what are the emotions which are you know, bucketed under these four groups. Mad is angry, irritated, grumpy, rageful, and despising. Bad is, as I've already mentioned, now glad and sad. So you can see even yearning and lonely, everything's coming under sad. And what do we do when we're sad? We just need to pause, but the pause button is important. When we are in the mad state, we need to slow down. We need to tell ourselves to slow down and come in lower in intensity because you can't jump from mad to glad, right? You need to slow down, you need to come down to pause, and then you need to move forward to learning and, and uh, relishing. Then bad is knocking at your door. Listen to the message it has come to give you. Take it, it'll move off. That emotion will not stay with you. It will serve the purpose and move off. And this is how Plachik also defined his Plachik's wheel of emotion in which he's not even color coded the emotions, but he's put in the intention. So admiration can turn into trust. Trust can turn into acceptance. Your little annoyance can turn into anger. Anger can turn into rage. So when you know the intensity and the emotion that you're feeling, you're able to control it better, manage it better, right? So it each also each emotion has a body language, which is very interesting. We see the emojis on our uh, WhatsApp, on, on our you know, forums, social forums. What is it made for, uh, about? You know, we're not aware about how we react to certain situations, are we? So when we are angry, we are big and loud. But when we are fearful, we get small and we hide. When we are in anticipation, we are waiting for something good to happen. We examine it closely. But when we are in surprise, we jump back and eyes become big as if trying to absorb the information that has just come in. This is a natural body reaction to these emotions. When we are in disgust, we say, you, right? We reject. When we are in trust, we embrace. When we are joyful, we connect with people. But when we are sad, we withdraw. So friends, this is how the emotions are mapped in this beautifully complex yet very useful machine called body, the physiology. So if you just absorb, you know, observe others and you observe yourself, you will be able to notice this. Words don't always say everything. So notice the nonverbal cues that are coming from others and as well as you, right? And, and see what you are feeling in the moment. Notice your body, notice where you feel clogged, you know, blocked. That is where some emotion is escaping. Now try and find it out. Delay, let it come out. And that is how you will be able to manage your emotions, not by hiding them. 
but by facing them. Similarly, with others, you may ask questions so that you know they can also process what they are going through. And this is how it is. Let's move forward. And uh, I have created an emoji board of my own face. Now, it's a very interesting process, and I would invite you all to do it. In my uh, workshops, we create our emoji boards, our mood boards, because this kind of gives you what is your reaction to various situations. And you embrace it. You know that these are the gestures. These are my subtitles when I'm not talking on the face. This is what I feel. And maybe unknowingly, we project it sometimes in groups. We are giving those reactions that people are understanding and they know the vibe and they are connecting or disconnecting with us. So when you know how you react bodily with various emotions, it'll be easy for you. And it's a fun thing to do, right? It, it's it filled with fun. So this is one of the exercises we do. Now, Navarasa, from our own uh, culture, we have something in uh, the Natya Shastra. There are nine rasas are born from bhavas, which is emotions. There are nine states of emotions that are born. That is shringa, joy, love, beauty, hasya, laughter, karuna, sorrow. So they recognize it and they have a certain way to emote it. Rodra, anger, veera, heroism and courage. Bhayankar, terror and fear. Vibhasta, disgust, adbhut, surprise, wonder, awe, shant, peace and tranquility. So with the four quadrants, this brings me to the four quadrants of emotional intelligence, which is self-awareness, self-regulation, others' awareness, and social skills. This is the four quadrant of emotional intelligence that we work very closely with. And I invite you all to work in the section of awareness and management so that you can become emotionally intelligent. And I will wrap up now with one story which is real of uh, United Airlines and it was in the news for quite some time. There was a girl called Phoebe Clabin and she was just 10 year old, mind you, 10 year old. And she was going to a summer camp in uh, Grand Bays, which is in between San Francisco and Chicago was the layover. So she had to drop, hop up and connecting flight was from Chicago to Grand Bays. And of course, the parents trusting the airlines and their ways they help the children to, you know, connect the flight and they help the children and they be with the children. So that is the responsibility that the airlines always takes up. So these, these parents sent the child and the child got extremely nervous when she had to do a connecting flight. She tried to connect with the people around after boarding and after uh, arriving at the state, at the airport of Chicago. And, but everybody was too busy. The adults were too busy to help her. And they said, please wait. And she kept waiting. She kept approaching them. She also tried to approach them to call her parents so that you know she can connect with them and they may be able to help. But she always got one answer, wait, we are busy. And in this, uh, you know, area what happened with her was that she missed her flight she had to wait for three hours in the grand base people were worrying about her not reaching on time and her parents were called from the people in the camp that she hasn't reached and the parents realized that their daughter is missing they kept calling united airlines they kept getting people asking them to hold on and to wait these are competent people skilled people who were put on jobs and they kept calling. And after 45 minutes of waiting, somebody came online and completely withdrew and did not take responsibility of such an event happening. Unless the father finally spoke to one of the United uh, Airlines, you know, receptionist. And he said, the caller, he just said that, you know, don't you have children? And a, he struck a chord somewhere and this person paused. And said, yes, of course, I have children. What would you do if they get missing, they go missing? What would you do? And then suddenly, this person, as if was awakened, and instead of putting him on hold, she immediately took action, found where the daughter was, 
and connected uh, people also helped her to take another flight and reach the campsite where people were waiting anxiously now for her. He appealed to empathy from apathy, which is feeling no emotion in a certain situation and being lost in processes and jobs to influencing people through empathy. You know, he called upon the same God that is within you and within me. You feel what I feel and I feel what you feel. And that collective feeling is what he called upon and he influenced and he got his result and his daughter was helped. The daughter, however, had grown up a little more in that period of three hours, seeing the apathy of human beings when they are adults, seeing how they are dispassionate towards a little child when she needs help. So friends, thankfully we are in India and here people are very empathetic and very helpful and success hasn't really gone on to our heads and we still have a very big place for emotions in our lives. I would like to wrap up with a beautiful and yet very meaningful poem written by Rumi. And with that, I leave you thinking about how you can harness these four capacities of awareness and regulation, of empathy and social skills, of communication and of listening by simply this poem. So I welcome you to hear it with a lot of attention. The being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. Even if they are a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice. Meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. Thank you very much for being a part of this training on emotional intelligence. Signing off, Shrija Chavar.